Aaron Weaver, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah, man, this is, uh, I'm really glad to have you on. So just for full transparency, um, I've known Aaron now for like over a decade, <laughs> which is crazy. Yeah. Crazy to think. Cool. So uh, Aaron's wife came to Hardbat for a very long time uh, named Mary. And uh, at the time, Aaron was going to med school, or at least in preparation of. And now he is fully out and about on his own and uh, started his own practice. So there is so much awesome stuff I want to dive into with you today. Um, you know, let's let's start with that med school piece. What was it that made you want to become a doctor in the first place? Yeah. Um, before I even answer that, I think uh, I was I was around when when Hardbat was in the the Green Monster that that original <laughs> you know the the the, the, the oh, original man. location which was uh, basically just a, a glorified garage is what is what I remember. Uh, yeah, when we all develop term. long long issues from being having been in that place, <laughs> that is... I will use you as as the source of 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 my uh, <laughs> getting back to health. Yeah, seriously. So, uh, but, but, but no, to answer, answer the question. Yeah. I think that uh, for me, uh, a big, a big motivator was, it was kind of a, a mix of, of, you know, science and, and the humanities. And I think that um, I know, I know it's going to sound really cliche, but just kind of taking care of people. And, and I always wanted to, to do primary care. I always wanted to be kind of the general practitioner that, that, can do a, a whole host of things and take care of, of, you know, 90, 95% of, of, of people's issues and their healthcare needs. Um, and, and, and really just be a part of a, of a community and involved in a community. And, um, a large, a large portion of that was my, uh, father was a big, big motivator there. He's, uh, he's a, a pastor. He's a Methodist pastor. And we, we moved around Pennsylvania a lot. I'm originally from central PA and we moved around Pennsylvania a lot. And he just, I saw him every, every time that we moved, he just integrated himself into that community and took care of people where they were at. And I think in medicine, the primary care doctor should be, should be a lot uh, similar, similar to that is just integrating themselves into the community, becoming involved uh, with, with, the patients with, with the community and, and people's lives. I love that. I love that. And I think, unfortunately, uh, you are not, uh, one with the masses on that. You know, I don't believe that that is the current situation uh, in healthcare. And I know I don't want to go down that rabbit hole prematurely because there's so many, so much other good stuff I do want to touch on before we get there. But, um, yeah, unfortunately I feel like there has been a, a disconnect with uh the average person and their position yeah it's it's really been an issue and something i think that's pretty palpable today is that there's there there's a problem in in healthcare especially in primary care and a lot of it has to deal with with access uh for patients to get an appointment with uh, with their with, with any primary care physician, um, especially especially in our area, um, because of of the system. You know, I, I typically don't like to blame any one particular person or or a group of people, but it's really a, a system wide issue that I think has to change uh, and has yeah. to change really quickly. Yeah, I'm excited to get into that with you. But before we get there, I wanted to talk a little bit more about med school and what you took out of it. You know, one of the things that I always yeah. find interesting is that, you know, these some of these uh, more prestigious colleges get a, a lot of uh, publicity for what they're able to produce um, in terms of you know who graduates from their programs. You know, you know, I think of the Yale and the Harvard, MIT, and so forth. But when you when you investigate a little bit further, what you find is that there is a uh, filtration process that takes place by people just being able to be accepted into these institutions by the way of ha having these like very high ceiling requirements for uh, the expectations placed around like SAT scores and such and IQ, even just to be able to get into those programs. And I think that med school is a filtration process in and of itself because it is just such a high pressure, high stakes long game environment, you know, what are some of the lessons 
that you took out of, of med school that maybe you didn't anticipate going in? Ooh, that uh, this 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 could take up the, the forty five minutes to an hour, right? <laughs> right here. No, I, I, I yeah, I think that when you go into to medicine and you you start med school, you, you expect it to be to be really difficult. You expect it to be a complete grind, but nobody, you know, nobody really prepares you. I mean, nobody. You can do any type of studying beforehand, or reading, or any undergrad courses that you did does not prepare you for the absolute um, rigor that you're going to go through um, in medical school. And uh, we would go through, we would go through like a year's worth of, of anatomy in like a week. And um, you know, that you do an undergrad, you know, it would take you a whole year to get there and it would be like one week and it's done. And, and so I think, you know, part of that was, uh, from day one, you just have to develop this kind of system uh, and uh, this kind of you know operating system for how you're going to work, and that kind of carries over throughout all of your training, now, not only in medicine, uh, medical school, but um, residency and and beyond. So I think from from day one, they kind of put you into this uh, absolute whirlwind of an environment. And they, they just say, Hey, let's, you know, you've got to figure this out. You have to get this system because that is honestly more important. And, and, and I think they even realize this, that's kind of more important when you're dealing with a lot of complexity and a lot of data. Um, and it's going to be like that for your entire career. The system that you have is pretty much just as important as even gaining the knowledge or, or the knowledge, how to utilize that, that knowledge. So I think that's, that's one of them. Um, I, I think that the other thing in, in medicine is, is, and especially in medical school, the system at which we're, you know, you pick your residency, it's very, it's very bizarre. I, I don't, I don't know if you're familiar with this. It's called the match. And, and basically you are, are you familiar with it? My, well, my wife being, um, uh, a pharmacist went through, a, I yeah. believe, a very similar system. Uh, you're talking yeah. about the matching process of getting a residency, where like you pick them, they pick you. Yes, yeah, and you, you, you actually, it's not like a thing. Hey, I, it's not like a normal job interview where you go and they say, "Hey, we like you, we'll hire you, train here." There you go. No, it's it's you interview months beforehand before this match. You write down. You say, "Hey, I like this program." You write down a list. You rank your list. The programs, you know, rank their their candidates, and then we put put it together all on the same day. Seriously, <laughs> so, it's the most stressful day just, of your life. I'm, I'm so, sure. So, honestly, for I mean, this is something you've worked towards for for four years, and then it's just going to be, hey, I'm just leaving it to this computer program to and this algorithm <laughs> to figure it out. Um, so, I just want to know where where i'm gonna work for the next three to five years and live that's and so crazy all these things it's yeah. so crazy that so like that that just like dangles in the wind you know what i mean yeah. like you're like i put all yeah. this time and effort into it i've done everything i possibly could that was within my control and yet i'm still at the mercy of this computer algorithm yeah, yeah. oh so, man so they just absolute stress of 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 the four years it, it actually just culminates in, in, in that that's like the climax of the of the stress i'm sure and, uh yeah it's it's crazy it's a, i'm sure it's a crazy experience well you know I, I think anytime you take anything major on in life you know i i my uh my my attempt at equating this to something that i've experienced before you know would be obviously starting and then running the business and growing the business and you know i think anytime you do something uh, that is a very, very large scale pursuit. It forces you to get very singularly focused and kind of turn all the bur other burners off, if you will. You know, so it's, I I'm sure there were some things that got turned down, unfortunately, when you decided to take this on. Um, but yeah. somehow, you know, you've always been someone that's maintained uh, a, a focus around your own personal health and fitness. And I'm sure that obviously, there's degrees to this and on, you know, on the continuum, it did have to get turned down quite a bit during some of the more stressful parts of med school and then eventually residency and even starting your own practice. But, um, you did the, uh, David Goggins four by four by 48, correct? Oh my gosh. I did that. Yeah, <laughs> I did that. 
Um, Can you explain to the audience what that was? I did that. Yeah. So, 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 so yeah, it's basically a a challenge that takes uh, place over a weekend. It's usually the first weekend of March, I I think. Um, And it was, it was this, this time. And it's where you, you run, you start on a Friday night and you at eight o'clock and you run uh, four miles every four hours for 48 hours. So uh, eight o'clock, midnight, 4 a.m., 8 a.m., you know, so on and so forth until I think 4 p.m. on Sunday is your last four mile run. So uh, it's 48 miles total over that over that. Was time. that the hardest yeah. thing physically you've ever done? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and I think that I think that really the biggest thing, it wasn't the, just the four mile stretches, the four mile stretches, you know, I did. So I guess as best as you can train for one of these things, I, I, I trained and tried to prepare, but you know, definitely the mental aspect of it was, was the bigger, was the bigger challenge. And I think that's really why, why I did it was, um, you know, there are a lot of people that run half marathons and marathons. And I mean, those are phenomenal milestones, but I wanted to do something that kind of pushed me mentally as well. And, uh, and I did, you know, when you wake up and you've slept, you know, at any one interval, you'll sleep maybe for two hours at a time, um, you know, one or two hours at a time after you kind of get in, you cool down, you have your nutrition and, um, running on those intervals, it was a, a struggle. And when it was 4am and you're out there and you got the headlamp on <laughs> and, and it's, and it's, and, and, and in March in Delaware, by the way, nobody tells you that especially this weekend, it literally went through the, the, the gamut of weather. It was snowing. I, I, I can't, I can't make this up on Saturday night. It was snowing. <laughs> and, and it, was, it was, it was like, it was 25 degrees and it was snowing. And on Sunday it was 70 degrees. I Holy went out crap. In, a, in a, I was out. yeah, I was out in a, in a tank top and shorts. That's so crazy. It, it, yeah. Yeah. It was, it was, well, what was uh, your was training like? Yeah. What was your training like building up to that? Yeah. So I really focused on, just trying to do multiple runs in a day, um, a few days a week. And so four days a week, I would run, um, uh, multiple times a day. And I build up to three runs. Um, uh, we really for one week, it would be three runs, uh, three times a day. And then about two weeks out, I did, um, a four week, a four run, day just 24 hours including one around midnight just to kind of simulate uh the 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 challenge a little bit and kind of dial in the nutrition plan uh and then surrounding that i did uh i actually did a lot of a lot of strength work um so i did about two two days of of lifting um um just total body, you know, cleans, squat, squatting, you know, things that you would be like, hold on, you're getting ready for a running challenge while you're doing that. But I, I realized like the, the actual, the strength and the injury prevention was going to sure. be, was going to be important in this. So, um, just, you know, I think it was, it was very basic. It was like cleans, squatting, deadlifting, bench press, you know, some pulling movements. I don't know. Yeah. The basic, the, the, the yeah. The, yeah. The, the, yeah. The, the compound movements more or less the real, the real, the real Mark Ripto type stuff. Um, yeah. so, so, uh, but, but it, it was great. I think that was, that was key, uh, to, to me, um, you know, completing it. Do you have hopes of ever doing something like that again? <laughs> uh, you know, it's funny cause I just mentioned yesterday, I said, um, to, to one of my friends, I said, Hey, you know, if I'm going to do it, this year i've got to start i've got to start training now i've, I've got to start absolutely dialing it in now so i i don't think i'll do it this year but i think uh, eventually i'd like to do it again or i i really maybe down the line once uh once i get a little bit a little bit more free time a little bit more established with the practice i'd like to get into some potentially some ultra races and and see how we that go. would be fantastic yeah that world is full, you know, I, I hate to put it this way, but that world is full of psychopaths. I mean, like the, <laughs> the, the level of, of just psychopathy you have to have to go music free for the, the duration they do and put themselves under yeah. the stress that they put themselves under in the conditions that they're in 
it, it is a like a, a mental warrior like none other. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And 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 again, I would like to do it not necessarily to to um you know, win the race or, or whatever, but really more of just yeah, the the kind of mental building kind of that mental toughness and and um that piece. I would love to just see see how I could do. And, sure. and I think and- part of me too. Yeah, part of me too loves just the training and the preparation and I yep. think that's why I did so well you know, with medical school is a lot of that was, you know, it's really just, you know, it's just training, you know, for four years and preparing you for, for four years and that kind of grind. Uh, I, I really enjoy, I really enjoy that. There's something to be said about setting your eyes out onto a very large task or uh, achievement that you want in the future, knowing that it takes a very systematic and incremental approach that requires discipline and mental fortitude and then seeing yourself go through the paces and then accomplish said said thing doing that time and time again is a huge boost in confidence that permeates into like other areas of your life you know like you do that physically and i'm sure that helps you in some regard be a good father it helps you in some regard be a good business owner be a good doctor you know so um and and i feel like you know, while everybody doesn't need to go out there and run four miles every four hours for 48 hours, I do think that putting anything into the future that requires a higher degree of expectation on yourself is just incredibly beneficial. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and I think that's, um, I I think you said it so well, looking back at, at those things, you know, the, the, the physical challenges, completing them and, and, and putting the preparation in. and even just the time of creating that system again, it really helps you. Uh, it's helped me down the line where I said, okay, well I have to do something that I've never done before. Right. So I, I, the basically I've got to start this business. I didn't know anything about business. I didn't know anything about opening it. I, I don't know anything, but listen, I, I've, I've done this, this, this physical challenge before where I didn't know there is no training plan for really, I, I, <laughs> I created a, there's no training plan for four by four by 48. You just, you, you know, you come, you, you, you get your data, you gather your data the best you can, and then you put something together and then you adjust it as, as you need to. And I think that, you know, down the line with, with this, uh, which has just been another challenge where it says, okay, I've never done this before. Obviously, there's plenty of business plans and outlines and things, but I put that together and then I kind of tweak it as I go along. And, and that can that can that spills over to, to every part of your life, nice. as, as you've said, you know, professionally, personally. And uh, I think that's true for a lot of people. Yes. Yeah, I agree. Now, now you started um, First Aid Direct Primary Care out of the trunk of your car, correct? <laughs> that, that's true. Yeah, that's that's. I didn't think that was going to start with that. Um, well, hey, that's that's the beginning, right? Like that's the origin yeah. story. So let's let's so, go there. Yes. Yeah, so basically, uh, you know, back up a, a few months prior, and I was I was employed. I was an employed um, family doctor for um, uh, for for three years following my residency in Wilmington, and uh, you know, I just. You know, here, here's what basically happened um, is my contracts ended, my kind of rookie contract, so to speak. It ended with my employer and I just felt like, hey, I, I want to do something different. And I had kept an eye on some alternative um, delivery models for healthcare and primary care specifically. Um, direct primary care was one of them, was a big one. And honestly, in August, I just said, hey, I'm going to start this. And I, I had no building. I had nothing. I, I just ordered some medication uh, through one of my wholesalers. And I, yes, I had it in the trunk of my car. I had a doctor bag with a stethoscope and a blood pressure cuff. That, that's literally it. And, and actually, in that, in that old you know, ophthalmoscope that people tell you in medical school, you're never, ever going to use again. It was like 10 years old. And I just put it in a bag and I said, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll come to you. And that's... And that month of August, I think I saw maybe 15 people and uh, any, anywhere there. 
their their home, their job. Um, and I, I mean, I, one story, this guy I was seeing, um, in his business, he's, he's a small business owner in Wilmington and, and, and he sells, he sells, uh, wood stoves and fireplaces and things. And people would come in and I'm taking this guy's blood pressure. I was like, is there a room that we can use? He goes, no, no, just do it out here. And I'm taking this guy's <laughs> blood pressure and people are walking in and he's going, it's, it's fine. It's fine. I'll be with you. In, in five minutes, <laughs> <laughs> and it was, the looks I was getting was it was crazy. Oh, yeah, that's, that's, that's classic. That's classic. Well, yeah. So you know, you you'd make the the call where you're like, okay, that's it. I want to do this thing, you know, my way. Um, yeah. Now I know I was speaking with a friend who's in med school, and and it's not going to come to me. But she she I had mentioned what you do, and she she had. Uh, given it a name, is it a specific type of care? So this is really it's it's a model. It's called direct primary care. There is, it is is the name, and so it's often you know people um, associate it too with with concierge medicine. You know, and you can and you can look at it that way. Um, in that direct primary care is kind of like concierge medicine, but for, but for the, for the masses, for, for, for the people where, um, and I'll, I'll just explain it right now if that's okay. I'm just going to go right. Yeah, no, it. please. Is, is that is that basically what we do is we, you know, our goal and our mission is to just give people affordable and accessible care. And so the, the cost is about a third of the cheapest concierge practice here. So it's, you know, $55, Per month, you know, to seventy five dollars per month based on your age, and 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 whereas concierge is much more expensive. The second thing is we don't bill any insurance, and in concierge medicine, typically they will also use your insurance for the different fees. You know, visit fee, you get a EKG, right? Different procedures that will all bill be billed to your insurance as well. Where I don't do any extra billing. There are no visit fees. There's no copays there's no procedural fees. So I do EKGs and um, I do point of care ultrasound here. I do um, any rapid, you know, testing, strep testing, et cetera. All of that is included. There's no extra cost for that. And so that's the big difference um, in those two types of care. But yeah, it's, it's direct primary care. That's what I do. Now, I know one of the things that you've spoken about on social media uh, in some of your posts that I thought were both very well written and also incredibly well received by me, <laughs> having been someone that years before, you know, Joy and I uh, got married and I had to take on my own health insurance, also dealt with the frustrations of what felt like doctors that were trying to get people in and out as quick as possible. And I think that your messaging around actually taking the time to sit down and listen to the needs of the patient, um, you know, much more thoroughly is something that's so incredibly missed right now. Uh, you know, do you enjoy that part of the process and, and why do you feel that's missing in healthcare, uh, you know, outside of what you do? Yeah, no, I, I love it. I, I absolutely love it. And I, and I think that most, doctors and most people in primary care would tell you that they they really enjoy it. They wish they had more time to talk to people because I, I can tell you in one of the one of the first lessons that you learn in medical school even is that the patient's going to tell you everything that's going on. Literally, they're not going to come out and say, hey, I have X, Y, and Z, but just listening to them and, and letting them talk and, and, you know, you have to ask a couple questions, but just hearing their story um, they're going to tell you everything that you need to know, essentially. And so when you get into a system where you're only listening to the patient for five minutes, well, not even not even five, maybe you have five minutes, you listen to them for two, and you need to get done what what you know your 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 employer or the insurance company says you have to get done. Well, then, what does this lead to? I mean, the downstream effect of that is, hey, we don't know exactly what's going on with you. We're going to do more tests. We're going to create higher costs, et cetera. And so I, I love it. I spend now I spend 30 minutes, an hour, hour and a half with people and, and just listening to them. And a lot of it is listening to their story um, and, and, and learning about them and their family. And then when they have an issue, they have the time. There's no, you know, it's not rushed. You don't feel like 
Uh, I don't feel like I'm rushing with anybody. There's nobody waiting uh, in the next two rooms. And so I, I think it's, I think it's not only, you know, something that's important, it, it has to be done I mean, to, to deliver good, good medical care. Yeah. There's this meme that, uh, is pretty popular and circulates and it says something to the effect of if your doctor doesn't ask about your sleep, stress, protein intake, and hydration before they write you a prescription, you don't have a doctor, you have a drug dealer. Yeah. Yeah. That, <laughs> you know, that, and that's that, obviously, I, yeah. But that that's that's so true. You know, I think if you if you and I and I just had this today where if you are I'll give you an example, if you're reviewing somebody's lab work with them and their I don't know, their 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 cholesterol is high, let's just take a very basic thing, and you don't talk to them about their nutrition, there's something wrong there. Right? There's there's something wrong. If you just say, Hey, here you go, take this, take this uh, medication. It'll lower the cholesterol, but you don't talk about their their nutrition or or their or their exercise, et cetera. Uh, there that that's that's not you know that that's just adding to the problem. To be honest, it is. Uh, but it, I think up. part of the issue, and you you can uh, back this up or, or give me your your thoughts on it, but it's also adding to your workload. You know, like yeah. anytime you try to dig deeper, it requires more of an effort on the part of the doctor or the, any of the professionals that are working with that individual. Yeah. Right. I, for me, like yeah. I obviously can't prescribe, I don't have the prescribing power you have, but someone could come to me and say, Hey, I'm low on energy. And I'm like, take caffeine pills. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Rather than yeah. inquire about their sleeping habits and some of the other things they're doing behaviorally that might be affecting their energy levels. Um, yeah. you know, and that's, but that's, that's the thing is it's like, it requires a little bit more elbow grease. Yeah, exactly. And that, but, that, but that is really, uh, I mean, honestly, it's, it's going to sound, I'm going to sound almost like a robot here, but I mean, that is why I signed up. I mean, that's why I did all the, the, the schooling and, and, and took out the loans and, and wanted to do this job was, was to help people. And sometimes it's just even helping them on their, uh, at a basic level. And, and that does require work, you know, that, that, yeah that it requires a lot of work. And I think we've gotten into this system in medicine where, you know, we're just about doing more and seeing more and um, charging more. And we just created a, a bubble uh, that we were just d delivering very costly, inefficient, inefficient and ineffective care here in America. Yeah. I was going to ask like, why do you think that, the healthcare system is so broken and flawed at this point. And I know that that's a very nuanced question, but. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of factors. And I think that, you know, the, the major factor is, is really all of the people, you know, that are in between the, the doctor and, and the patient. And, and that's what it boils down to. And all, and, and those people um, are, you know, insurance companies and health systems and pharmacy benefit managers, uh, or PBMs for short. And, and, you know, what they do is, is they basically, you know, have, have set up, uh, you know, all these different roadblocks, whether it's paperwork, whether it's quality metrics, whether it's uh, something called meaningful use with electronic medical record, et cetera. And, and they've, they've, they've taken away that relationship that the doctor patient relationship and, and, and how they've done that really is saying, Hey, uh, we're going to, we're going, we're going to pay the doctors. We're, gonna, we're the ones that are going to pay the doctors. And so we can control exactly um, what, what gets paid for, how much you get paid, um, what gets done for the patient, what doesn't get done for the patient, et cetera. And so, so much of being a primary care doctor in the traditional system is literally going, you've probably heard this many, many times and, and, and I'm sure everybody's heard it is just saying, well, you know, this is what you're writing something. Nobody writes like this anymore. Everything's on the computer, but <laughs> you, you, you're, you're putting something in the computer and you say to the patient, well, this is what your insurance wants us to do. Right. Mm -hmm. Like that, that line, which really should never ever be used. I mean, theoretically it never should be used. It should be what is best for, for, for the patient that that's what should be done. And so I think that we have so many of these middlemen, so many of these third parties that are involved in medicine when really they should be used as resources on the outside, on the periphery of the doctor patient relationship, uh, that it's created a big problem. 
Yeah, I, I think another point here, um, which I definitely want to get your opinion on, is that I, I feel like part of the issue at hand is that far too much of the focus comes by the way of a reactionary type of healthcare rather than a preventative. You know, and this is where it's important for a defining of terms to maybe update our understanding of what healthcare actually means. And I think, like I always tell our coaches, I'm like, you are fighting in the trenches of preventative healthcare because everything you are doing is making the conversations that people have with their doctors not only easier to have because we've better educated our clients around being able to do the basic maintenance on their own personal health, but also preventing them from having to have the hard conversations of like, hey, I'm sorry, you've eaten this way for 20 years, now you're diabetic, and I have to give you this whole slew of medications, right, as, as a reaction to that, right? So do you find yourself, because of the way you run your practice, able to get more into the, the, the root cause of some of these issues and be a bit more of a preventative force in their lives? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, I really, I really value that aspect of, 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 of primary care now. And I think now as I have the time to do that and, and, and sit down and talk to someone about, about their nutrition, um, talk to them it really, even just backing up is just talking about that really, what does their, you know, if they have chronic illnesses, what does that actually mean? How do those, how do those work? How, how does that affect your body? And then go into, Hey, what are some, some steps that we can do to, to, to reverse this, to be honest. And, and, uh, we, uh, I did that before, but it took a, an enormous amount of energy to, to do that. Um, when I was employed a, in my previous practice and, uh, was that, it, it, was it that was because you were costly. swimming? Was that because you were swimming through so much of the paperwork? Do yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And it, and it just meant, you know, if you spent any extra time with someone trying to talk about nutrition um it would be one you just you felt like you wouldn't do a complete job and two you knew hey i'm already 45 minutes behind i'm going to be another 45 minutes by me another hour and a half to two hours behind and uh for me that i i maybe i picked the wrong profession because i was i was i have a lot of anxiety about running behind and so uh, <laughs> every day i was just the sweat was pouring down my face from from that anxiety but um, so that's something we try to do, uh, or I tried to do, you know, in my previous practice, but here we're able to actually sit down and talk with people and work with them, uh, nutrition wise and, and, and exercise and really dive into that. And then also I think the other thing is point them in, in people, you know, to people that are similarly aligned with us, you know, in terms of nutrition, exercise, you know, et cetera. And, and. Uh, actually be able to follow up with those, you know, practitioners and have discussions with them. Um, I just was on the phone um, yesterday with a, with, a, with actually with a physical therapist and they were surprised. They're like, hold on, you, you answered the phone and you have 20 minutes to talk to me. And I, and I was like, yeah, this is just what, this is what I do now. And it's, it's really refreshing. Yeah, to go along with that, you know, I would imagine that many of the patients that you see aren't coming from doctors or other primary care physicians like yourself. You know, what are some of the major or main complaints that you've seen coming, you know, with your patients as they, they come into your office and have a different experience for the first time? Yeah, I think the primary complaint is really access. Patients are really frustrated with with their previous doctor and, and, and doctors and, and 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 health systems in just being able to have their doctor or the doctor's office answer simple questions uh, or just provide simple services and a lot of that goes from hey I call in can't get anybody on the phone it's a phone tree I have to leave you know, voicemails and messages um, nobody gets back to me. That's a very simple thing that we we correct right off the bat by we say, hey, we're going to utilize technology to directly communicate with you. And so patients come in um, right off the bat. They have my clinic cell phone number, which they text. And I will tell you that it, a lot of the times it's just very basic things, simple questions. 
that take about 15 seconds to answer. And it's, it's been, it's, it's been huge. It's been a huge improvement uh, in that access. The, the other thing is getting appointments uh, that, you know, same day, next day. Uh, I can tell you that most, if, if they're taking insurance and somebody is telling you that they have same day appointments, uh, you know, it, it's kind of like getting a, 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 an iPhone, the newest iPhone. Um, by the time you call at 8.05, if the doctor has been open since eight o'clock, the slots are already gone. There's no, there's no access. Uh, if it is, it's very, very limited. And so we're able to, to get people in literally that day or the next day because when they're sick, uh, because we've cut down, we don't see 30 people a day. We see on average four to six people a day because that, yeah. what we, yeah, what we That's do is we say, of. Hey, yeah, what we do is we say, Hey, uh, we, what we do is we take care of you in the way that best suits for you. If you have to come into the office then we bring you into the office. If we can do it in another way, which is via text, via video, um, phone call, people send us photos of things. Uh, uh, one, of, one of the earliest stories that I have is, is this patient had a, had a tooth abscess. I, I'm not sure why you would, ju- you could just tell me you had a tooth abscess. I knew this guy for a while. He felt he needed to take a video of the abscess draining. And I said, I believe you. <laughs> he, so he said he said it to me and, and, and this was at seven forty five in the morning. And I was watching my, my oldest daughter do handstands in the living room. And he sent me this video and, um, I sent it, I said, Hey, you need some antibiotics. I sent it in and, and 30 minutes later he had them at the pharmacy. That's and so great. that, and that, and that's an example of how we just have really efficient care and that, you know, that's part of the value that you get with, with coming to our office. It's not necessarily that the biggest the biggest kind of question or comment I get is why well, I don't come to the doctor every every month. Well, right, but just having the accessibility of of having the of having a doctor and having a primary care office that's going to work for you and going to be there when you need them. You know, I I, I pose the question back to them: What is that worth uh, for you? And for I think sure. for, the, for the pricing, for the pricing and the affordability, it's 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 absolutely worth it. Yeah, I would say so. You know, there was one thing um, you said that made me think. So one one of the jokes I always make about healthcare systems, uh, especially when it comes to these insurance companies, is that I feel like they took their playbook as far as their business model goes from Comcast in that they send you on this like labyrinth whenever you call to make any sort of an adjustment. So like, let's say your billing comes and it, it's it's off. They want to make it so much of a pain in the ass to be able to do anything that you just go, oh, heck with it, I'm not even going to bother. Because every time, either for myself or for Julia, we've had to call into the insurance companies to make an adjustment to a bill a billing error. It is, it's almost like I spend more time than it's worth trying to get a hold of someone that can actually correct it. It is never a fun process. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, even for me, I can tell you that calling an insurance company now because um, I, I still, you know, obviously patients of mine carry insurance. There's things that, that they like to go through their insurance and I work with them and, and calling an insurance company now, even as, as the doctor, you're calling in the, the, the doctor line, you know, the provider, it's really on the Friday line. We're supposed to get somebody 25 minutes later. Uh, I'm kind of like, all right, I have, I, I know I have extra time, but I don't have, have that much time. And well, you crazy. feel like you're yeah. wasting it at that point. Exactly. Yeah. And, and, well, and that's, and you bring up a good point is that, and that that's another uh, uh, way that insurance companies save money and, 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 and make money, et cetera, is that they, they just bombard physicians with paperwork and prior authorizations and things called, you know, peer to peer where you have to get on the phone with the insurances, uh, team of doctors and justify why you're ordering tests or lab X, Y, and Z or medication. And, you know, the doctor that's seeing 30 patients a day, and then at the end of the day, answering 20 or 30 messages, it says, oh my, you know, I, I just don't have, I don't have time to deal with it. And what do they do? They kind of give up and they say, okay, we've got to try an alternative or we're just going to abandon that altogether. And that leads to just terrible care, just really poor, poor value. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, it sounds like overwhelm is just your destiny when you choose this career path. And it's really unfortunate because, you know, it, it's, it's incredibly obvious to anybody that 
somebody that needs to do the real deep work needs time to focus, right? And doctors fall into that category, right? You're solving very complex problems. We shouldn't have you micromanaging and multitasking throughout the entirety of your career. It's just not feasible for somebody that we want to solve some of the most complex issues in healthcare. Yeah, absolutely. I, I agree with that. And what we tried to do was we've tried to, okay, well, let's add some more staff. Let's uh, get somebody to help with the prior authorizations, et cetera. And, and what we keep doing is we just keep building and layering on top of this, of this problem. And we've even gone as far in, in something called, you know, people to always talk about value-based care. If you've ever heard that in medicine and uh, we've established these organizations called it. ACOs, Accountable Care Organizations, which is a, a separate organization. And this is how far we've gone in medicine. I just, just want to throw it out there. The hospital says, hey, and insurance says, oh, hey, listen, we don't trust our doctors enough to, to do value-based care and save us money. So we'll create a separate organization that works with that hospital. And they'll work with the doctor's offices and we'll staff it. We'll spend a bunch of money to run it. And they'll work with the doctor's offices to save us money, the insurance companies, and if they save us enough, we'll give them a, a small percentage of the savings, right? So what happens when the health system saves money and they get that percentage? The money goes back into the organization that they had to help create, uh, a, lar a large majority of it. So we're just kind of, you know, we're, we're spinning our wheels and what we're doing is we're working with a system where we, we, everybody on the outside says, oh, we love value-based care. We're really about high quality care, but then we're over here charging for every single thing that we possibly do. And that's just, we're, we're, we're literally, the water is coming in the boat and we're just trying to scoop it out. It's, it's, we're, we're fighting against ourselves. Yeah. And I think, you know, we could, we could kind of turn the mirror around a little bit here because I think we addressed one, one very large issue, which is a, a failing and overinflated healthcare system, but we can also address the issues that they are actually designed to fix that are actually getting worse, which are things like obesity, heart disease, atherosclerosis, yeah. right? And everything that falls into that camp, you know, why do you think that we are having such a hard time connecting to people to be able to make real and lasting change so that we don't see our country continuing to go in the wrong direction when it comes to metabolic and physical health. Yeah. I, I think that, you know, part of it is we have, we have a, a really great system. And I just want to say this, we have a really great system when it comes to very acute things, when it comes to traumas, and it comes to surgery and it com comes to critical illness, we have a phenomenal system. But what we've tried to do is take that same system and put it into dealing with chronic disease. And I think that that doesn't work for establishing relationships with people um, and, and really diving into uh, gaining that trust from, from patients and, and from people and from families to one, have an honest conversation to say, hey, this is what we're noticing on, you know, let's talk about your weight. Let's talk about, you know, obesity. Let's talk about, um, let's, let's have an honest conversation about your lab values and your cardiac risk. And I think that that really starts, you know, for me, that starts with, with developing a relationship to be able to have the hard conversations and the patient feeling like they have a, they're, they're being supported by, by a system uh, and they have that, that system in place. And I think definitely we, in primary care and in medicine, we, we don't do that enough. And I think that's one of the great things that you guys do is you have that community and you have that, 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 that area where people feel like, Hey, they're not just out there alone in terms of their health and their wellness. They have that community. Sure. And it's well, just not something yeah. that we've established here in, in the medical community. We haven't done it. Yeah. I mean, I, I think what you just demonstrated was this, you know, you exposed this reluctancy to be vulnerable 
in or with with your doctor because of a lack of trust. And I, you know, if you were to ask, well, what's what's creating the separation there? What's preventing the trust? I think it's a lack of time. You know, like you spend enough time with people and you get to know who they are as people aside from what they do as a profession, you know, you, you get a pretty good understanding of how genuine or disingenuous they are. And I I don't believe that there's a bunch of disingenuous doctors running around with malintent. I just don't think they're getting enough time with their patients. Do you think that's the case? Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I I agree. I think if you had, if you, if you sat down, you know, nine out of 10, the doctors, uh, they would, they would tell you the same thing. Uh, I think everybody wishes they had more time. They, they wish that, that they could talk, you know, for longer or listen to, listen to their patients speak. And, and, you know, I've always taken an approach where, you know, the patient, not only do I need to feel comfortable in, in treating the patient and listening to them, et cetera, but the patient has to be comfortable with me as well. You know, it's, it's so, you know, there's a lot of talk about, well, I don't talk about my, you know, I don't talk about myself. I don't talk about my, you know, any of my personal life or anything. Now I don't sit down and tell everybody my life story, but <laughs> I think that, you know, not, nobody wants to hear that. But I mean, if, if, you know, I do, you know, it's nice to hear that, you know, and feel like your, 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 your doctor is, is, is a human, you know, and we're not just, you know, these, 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 these robots, you know, spitting out, Hey, this is what our insurance insurance company wants us to say, is that, Hey, we have, um, you know, we want to develop these relationships with you. So, Hey, if you know that I have a life outside of this and, you know, I have three kids and, and I do X, Y, and Z, you know, in my spare time, et cetera, I become relatable. And I think that that's really what, what it's, what it's been about for me. Now we talked about how this has affected the relationships you're able to have with your, um, clients or patients, but how has it, impacted your relationship with other doctors? Like, do you get a sense from some other physicians that this is the direction that everyone is starting to lean? Yeah, I, I get a lot of comments uh, about, about what I'm doing and and I've had several, several doctors reach out and, and talk about just advice on starting. How did I start? And, uh, and, and, and ask me, you know, their opinion um, on, on the direction that medicine is going. And I think that, I think this is what you're going to start to see. You're going to start to see the, the pendulum in healthcare swing back towards smaller, independently owned, you know, uh, physician practices, uh, that, that kind of, we go back, you know, maybe 30 years, 40 years where we're very much entrenched in the community and owned by physicians, um, and, and, you know, practicing medicine kind of on our own terms. And I think that's what any doctor really wants to, to do. Yeah. Now the, the business owner in me, um, or should say the entrepreneur is thinking about the disgruntled people that this may affect. Have you felt any bit of, uh, resistance or hesitancy or any, anyone coming to the table with, uh, concern about that possible pendulum swing? I, I haven't yet, you know, I had, I had, um, somebody made a comment to me of like, Hey, I should be walking around with a bulletproof vest because I'm going to be taken <laughs> away. Uh, I don't think I'm that important, but I, I don't think I have that, you know, big of a chunk of, of the pie right now. But I think that, uh, yeah, I, I think they were concerned because I was just kind of I don't want to say uncovering, but just bringing to light some things, some, some, some major flaws in the system. And yeah, I think you're going to start to see health systems try to replicate this model of, of direct primary care or something very similar. And, you know, it's already been tried. Um, and, and I, I think that it's, my concern is that it's going to be kind of a watered down, you know, approach where they're going to, um, they're going to have it kind of in name, but they're going to be create a lot of layers in terms of staffing, in terms of administrators, and it's not going to have the same feel as you would as, uh, you know, interacting with an independent practice. Yeah, I know that makes sense. Yeah. I was just, I was curious because like you said, I, I don't think it's, it hasn't become popularized enough to where too much of the revenue has started to leak 
But as that takes place, somebody, uh, you know, one, some of the higher ups at some of these insurance companies are probably going to step forth or maybe even some of the larger, uh, you know, hospital institutions are going to be like, all right, what, what the heck's going on? How do we prevent this leak? Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. And that, and that's why we, uh, you know, I've tried to be pretty active in terms of, uh, reaching out, uh, to government officials, et cetera, to, to let them know, Hey, this is, this is what we're doing. This is kind of the data that we already have. Um, because it's been done in different states, there's been different legislation that's been, you know, that's tried to to, to pass to put restrictions um, in into place, um, and and so would really like to avoid that here. Um, of course, we haven't run into it yet, but but uh, like you said, we haven't we haven't really bitten off um, you know much of that of that revenue yet, but. But I think as it starts to grow and people start to realize that this is a way to practice medicine that is not only good for the patients, I mean, it's excellent for the patients, but it's also, also excellent for, for, the, for the physicians. And, and as you start to, people start to realize that in, in medicine, um, hey, I can be a physician and I can, you know, be home at, at four o'clock or five o'clock and the charting is done and, and, and I can actually have a life outside of medicine. Right. Uh, they're going to start to gravitate towards that and they're going to start to do it. Well, yeah. And I mean, you're, you, no one goes to school for eight to 12 years if they don't find meaning in what they do. And I can't imagine that the current state of the healthcare system isn't to some degree or another robbing doctors and physicians of that meaning. You know, and I think you've recaptured that and probably reinvigorated that in your life. So despite the fact that you had to start this thing out of the trunk of your car, and I know from being a business owner that the first few months, let alone, you know, even the first few years can be a bit of a challenge and a struggle, you know, I'm sure that you've brought so much of that meaning back into your life because you've created uh, relationships that you otherwise wouldn't have been able to, uh, you know, establish working for somebody else. In a more of a traditional yeah. setting, yeah, absolutely, uh, absolutely, and and I think that when when the patients from my old practice have come to see me and they kind of try to make a really bad joke, but it's like you know if you liked me before, this is like me on steroids as a physician, and it's um, it's it's really it's going back. It, it's kind of like what I think or what I thought before I went into to medicine, what practicing medicine was like. Uh, and, you know, I'm able to go to somebody's home when they're sick, just because it's the right thing to do. And, 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 and it really brings back a lot of the art of medicine practicing this way. And for me, it's been, it's been so, so refreshing. Yeah. I mean, I'll be honest, Aaron, before you came onto the scene, I didn't even know that this existed. And maybe that's just my own ignorance and this is a blind spot in my life, but I would venture to say that is just because it's so rare still. Um, so thank you so much for everything that you're doing because it is a incredibly, um, you know, bold and important pursuit. And it's a quite frankly, a breath of fresh air for me as a coach to see uh, a physician step up and, and do what you're doing. Yeah, no, I, I really, I, I knew that this was going to be an adventure and doing something that really isn't being done in our area and, and, and not well understood at first. But I think that the more I've been on the scene and getting the word out there and, and talking about it, it's been really well received. And I think it's something that people people are looking for. Yeah. No doubt. Well, hey, tell uh, yeah. tell the audience where they can learn more about your practice and what you do. Yeah. So uh, practice name is First State Direct Primary Care. You can find us uh, on on the web. Uh, nobody says that anymore, but it's firststatedpc.com is our website. Uh, and you can find us on Facebook at First State DPC and Instagram First State DPC, I think. Yeah, at First State DPC. So um, check us out. Plenty of uh, content on there. And um, if you're interested or you just have any questions for me, you can check out our website or give me a call. 302-722-7082. Sorry, that's a shameless plug. 
Uh, <laughs> Dude, number. that's what I have so, you on here for. So, so that's, that's it. Uh, no, I love it. But if you're really looking for an authentic experience and, and redeveloping that kind of relationship with, with a doctor that's going to care about you just as a, as a human, um, give us a, give us a uh, shout and, and check us out. Well, I can promise you that that message is going to be received very well by the audience because everyone listening to this uh, really cares about their health and establishing relationships with the people that also care about their health. So that's awesome. And I really do hope someone, at least at least one person, if not many, take you up on that. So uh, again, thank you for all that you do. And uh, I definitely want to have you on again. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it.